you can see every single detail on them. And it is very, very clear that Rails and Daypol have gone above and beyond to make sure that this is the definitive Terrier model. Hi there everyone, welcome along to another video here with me, Jenny Kirk. It's really good to see you, I hope I find you well, and today we've got a review of the really long-awaited Rails of Sheffield stroke Daypol Terrier, and I've been really excited for this. I got to take a look at the pre-production prototype way back last year at Alexandra Palace, and the production models have finally come through. So without further ado, and in association with the channel sponsor Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders, and accessories designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. We're going to be taking a closer look at this new product and also stay tuned for the end because as always we're going to be doing a full DCC fitting guide in association with the channel sponsor Trainomatic and show you just how to fit a decoder of your own into one of these models. But without further ado come with me and I'm really excited to show you this model. This is the new model in the Rails packaging. It's uh, made in partnership with Daypol, and it really is actually quite a heavy duty box, very reminiscent of the regular main range Daypol boxes, and it just oozes quality from the start. This particular version that we've got here is uh, catalog number 4S-010-006, and it's an A1X Terrier number 32661 in the BR Black Lake Crest. At the time of filming, there are four models currently coming through, and these are the BR Early Crest, the BR Late Crest, such as this one, and there's also the LBSCR burnt umber liveried model as X Gypsy Hill. It doesn't actually have the name on the tanks, uh, but this is quite a nice pre-grouping livery. And then the final livery option is the very, very eye-catching Kent and East Sussex Railway Blue. So those are the four options available at the moment. The rest of the range that's been announced, including some of the other liveries, is coming through by the end of this month, hopefully. So let's get this out of the box and actually in here as well we've got the uh, owner's workshop manual or the owner's manual and this is actually really good. It's um, pretty comprehensive and even though there are factory fitted DCC and DCC sound versions on the way it does give you a pretty comprehensive look at how you fit your own DCC chips in there as well. So there's a lot of information in here included with diagrams and it does make getting in and out of this model really, really easy. There's a lot of foam packaging in here and it does actually mean that these stand up to all sorts of punishment in the post. Not that this got any great punishment, but certainly the extra packaging really does go a long way to ensure that the model turns up in pristine condition. There's a little extra detail bag here and these appear to be additional, I think that they're vacuum pipes. Uh, but uh, they're there for the user to fit if you so choose. But I suspect that to fit them, you'll need an alternative coupling source. They may interfere with the slimline tension lock couplings. And this is what we have all been waiting for. It's been so long awaited. I got really, really excited when Rails finally announced that these were making it through for distribution. And I know a lot of you guys have been asking me over and over again, what's happening with the Rails Terrier? Well, the COVID-19 situation has kind of uh, put a crimp on uh, models coming through from all manufacturers. And that has delayed these, but boy has the wait been worth it when I see what they have got here. We did take a really good look at the pre-production model, and that was in the Kent and East Sussex Railway Blue uh, at Alexandra Palace back in 2019. And even then, it was very apparent that this was 
very much a premium model with an awful lot of attention to detail. And I'm not disappointed with this production model. Indeed, it's quite interesting to note that Rails and Daypole have taken some of this extra time to address some of the uh, potential issues that arose from the pre-production models. And I think they've decided quite rightly to go all out to make this pretty much the definitive model of this class. It's also interesting to note that they have tooled up for so many different variations. So this is the A1X class. Now, a number of these locomotives were rebuilt by the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway into this slight variant of the class uh, as they reached the midpoint of their lives. Not all of the locomotives were rebuilt, and uh, so they've also tooled up for the A1 variant. And when you compare them side by side, there are actually quite some obvious detail differences. And this was something that the old X Daypole then went to Hornby model was kind of a hybrid of, of both and therefore represented none. And that has really been addressed with this. So what we've got here is an accurate rendition of all of the detail quirks relevant to this particular identity of locomotive. And other locomotives uh, across the class of terriers uh, are able to be tooled up to exactly match the prototypes. The A1X did away with some of the flaring at the front and the sandboxes. That's probably the most obvious detail difference. And as you can see on this model, we have the accurate splashes over the front wheels and there is no sandbox in there and there is no flaring out of the front that would have been a, a, uh, an obvious mark of the A1 class. And actually, whilst this isn't a Rails model, this is the new retooled version of the Hornby Terrier, what you can see there is actually this one here is an A1 class, and this is the A1X. And you can see those different details at the front that Rails and Daypole have accurately managed to get on there. The actual finish of the decoration on this model really is exquisite. And one of the things actually that strikes me when I've looked at this model out of the box is that the photographs on the Rails of Sheffield website don't actually do it justice. I think it, this, this livery does look so much better in the flesh particularly the crest on the sides of the tanks is really sharp and crisp. And uh, if you look at the photographs on the Rails of uh, Sheffield website, it looks a bit blurry, but believe me, in the flesh, it is as crisp and sharp as you could ever wish. The rest of the tempo printing is really nicely done. We have some really sharp numbering there on the cab sides and the lining is so crisp and true and is exactly inch perfect to where it needs to go. On the boiler barrel as well, you might have thought that the BR black liveries look a bit boring when you think of the really, really ornate pre-grouping liveries that are also going to be available towards the end of this month. But actually, we can see on there we have this exquisite, very, very understated, but sharp nonetheless, red lining as per the BR prototypes. One of the other areas as well, which is really a joy to look at, is the pipework, the kind of coppery pipework on here is really nicely realised and the boiler fittings are so crisp and sharp. You can see every single detail on them and it is very, very clear that Rails and Daypole have gone above and beyond to make sure that this is the definitive Terrier model. So when we look round there, that copper colour looks like metal, it looks like real copper. And they go down over the boiler and then we've got these uh, fittings on the boiler as well, which I think were to do with the injectors and the water pump. And they are very, very fine, prototypical, and as far as I can tell, very much to scale. Front splashes as well, we have more of the lining. And this kind of, I think it's an off-white coupled with the red. This is just really nicely done. And I have to admit that um, a part of me was really, really hoping that uh, the uh, London, Brighton and South Coast Railway improved engine green livery would be one of the first 
to be released because that's the one which I kind of had my heart set on. But seeing the BR livery in the flesh, I'm really, really warming to this. And I can actually see that this livery is possibly now one of my favorites for these terriers. The back of the cab where we've got the slightly changed bunker arrangement for the A1X. We still got the toolbox at the bottom. There's no lining on any of that. So some of this detail perhaps can be lost to the black, but it is all still there. We've also got these uh, brackets here for uh, well, on the uh, Southern Railway. They had kind of discs and I guess later on they may have then gone over to using them with, uh, with just standard lamps. But they are really nicely done. They're molded in, I think, they're metal because they are pretty robust. And that's one of the things actually in handling this model is that whilst some of the detail is exceptionally fine and looks like it is very, very fragile by being scale thickness and scale size, it doesn't seem to actually be prone to damage. I've handled this locomotive quite happily and there's not a single shred of detail that has come adrift during that. The chimney as well is really nicely done and there's no seam at the bottom. The chimney cap itself, which would have been painted brass, I guess, earlier in their careers, these locomotives had ornate brass chimney caps and this would be the same fitting but painted black as I guess a kind of austerity measure under British Rail. So there is a seam around the top where that brass chimney cap would be uh, as per the prototype. The steps on the side of the model are reasonably nicely done. I'm just looking there, the actual treads themselves do seem a little bit thicker perhaps than scale thickness, but it does mean that these are very, very robust. And actually, I think they're plastic, but certainly, they do feel very, very robust and not at any risk of falling off. Rest of the fittings, we've got a turned, I think it's metal whistle on there, really nicely done, matches the correct profile. And then again to the back of the cab, real nice touch with these bars that protect the rear windows from coal being uh, dumped in the bunker and potentially breaking the glass. Really nicely done, really, really fine. And I really like the way that the actual brass fittings have been finished with the Tampo printer before that detailing part has been applied. So we get this really sharp demarcation of the colors. In terms of the rest of the model, we've got really nice fine handrails and pipe work. And actually, the closer that you look into all of this, it's just the detail keeps on giving. There's some quite exquisite rivet detail across the top of the tank and around some of the filler pipes. Uh, I, th I believe that these may well have been the plated over points where the condenser apparatus would have fitted in. Some of the locomotives in the range are offered with that condenser apparatus fitted and it's nice to see that they have tooled up for all of these different options and we don't have a one-size-fits-all terrier, which I guess has been the bugbear for so many decades. I mean, don't get me wrong, the original version of the terrier was a great model for its time, but this just shows how much can be done in this day and age. Now, the detail differences that I highlighted back when we did the comparison with the pre-production model were actually quite stark. And once you've seen them, you can't unsee them. And what I want to do is focus in on some of the things that make this model set apart from the new retooled Hornby version. Now, I want to be absolutely clear at this point that the newly retooled Hornby version is a very good model. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But what we're seeing here with the Rails Daypole Terrier is it's gone that extra level. So with the Hornby Terrier, we don't have, for example, first off, any real representation of motion underneath the boiler. It's not obvious at first, but once you then turn to the rails and daypole terrier, there is a representation between the frames correctly of that inside motion. And it is something that you can see, and it does add a little bit extra to this model. Other areas as well, well, inside the cab, they both have very nicely detailed cab interiors, but when it comes to the rails and daypole model, 
it doesn't have that solid glazing bar and I've brought this up as well on other models and I feel that it's a little bit of a detraction when I look inside the Hornby cab and when we did the review of this model I did draw attention to this there's like a solid clear glazing bar both on the front and the back and it does slightly detract from the detail of the back head of the cab. When we look inside the rails and daypole terrier, we don't get that. We get proper flush glazing that doesn't obstruct any of the other details. So when we look in there, there's no shiny bar of clear plastic. And it means that we can see those gauges at the top there in some very crisp detail. And it is a really nice touch. Again, looking to the back of the cab, we have that flush glazing too. There's not a bar of glazing across the front there. And for me, it's I know it's an area that you wouldn't necessarily see from most viewing angles, but it does go to show just how much attention to detail has gone into the Rails and Daypole Terrier. We also have a coal bunker there at the back that's modelled empty of coal, and that does give an excellent clear palette for the modeler to be able to put in as much or as little coal as they want to model this locomotive in a variety of different states. One of the other areas that I picked up on when I did the comparison with the pre-production model was the side rods here, particularly the points at which they connect to the wheels. There's this kind of uh, hexagonal nut. In fact, actually, it's not quite hexagonal. It's almost square, but with rounded ends as per the prototype. And that was one of the areas that Rails and Daypol really wanted to strive to, was that there wasn't to be compromises with this model. They wanted it to be perfect. And I can well believe that this model will still be available pretty much in this form in 20, 30, 40 years to come and still hold its own with the models of the time because really there just isn't anything that I can see to fault with this. If we look to the Hornby model, it's held on with completely hexagonal nuts and I understand why Hornby has done this. It's a standard fitting and it does make maintenance quite easy. But when you compare the two, the correct shape uh, connecting uh, pieces there do actually show themselves. They both have the brake rigging all attached from scratch. And actually, as an A1 class, this has different brake blocks, as you would expect. To the rest of the model, the front face is captured really, really well. The buffers aren't sprung, but then again, they aren't on the Hornby model either. And I don't believe that that's a big issue whatsoever. Now, I think that sprung buffers sometimes are just adding a rod for their back for the manufacturers in that they're something that adds to the price without necessarily adding to anything else. So I'm quite happy with that. We've got correctly applied this raised front number plate. In the pre-British Rail liveried versions, we don't get that. So again, another detail difference between the two. But it has to be said that the Hornby version as well does also cater for that. The couplings are in NEM pockets, but they're a slightly different NEM pocket to those on other manufacturers' models. Instead of having that triangular mounting point, they're instead fixed back to these screws inboard of the couplings. And with the aid of a sprung piece of plastic in there, this gives a quite nice but strong self-centering mechanism with a great deal of lateral play for the couplings, which means that when this goes round tighter corners, you're much less likely to get the couplings causing buffer lock or pushing the wagons or coaches off the track in the train. Overall, that really does show to me that we've got a great package here. And everything other than those two little pipes that I showed you in the detailing pack is factory fitted. So there's really no need for the end user to do an awful lot at all. I'm going to now turn to a DCC fitting guide and it's something that I do in all of my reviews and this is no different. It does give details in the uh, little booklet that comes with it but I'm going to talk you through this and actually it's really really easy. We recommend the use of the Trainomatic 
18 pin decoder. Now be a little bit careful, you want the standard 18 pin decoder and not the 3 volt TILIG compatible version. So just make sure that you order up the right one off the website. But fitting this is actually really, really easy. And when we come afterwards to showing the locomotive running, you'll see that actually there's a few extra little functions that this locomotive offers which the competition doesn't natively out of the box. To undo both of these screws to get inside, carefully take out the couplings. The front one, just be a little bit careful because of the uh, way the brake rigging goes across and then very carefully taking hold of the center wheel just gently rock and ease the uh, chassis out. Now you'll see there that there are two wires connected. Be very careful don't just yank the chassis out because what they actually do and this is one of the other extra features that this model offers it is pre-fitted with a speaker for if you wish to sound fit this locomotive. And it's actually a really great touch that this has all been designed in from the start. And it means that DCC sound fitting this loco is an absolute doddle because you don't have to worry about a speaker, you just get the appropriate DCC 18 pin chip with the sound on it and all of the speaker is already taken care of. And it fits in there quite nicely. The actual DCC decoder, if I just hold these like that, is there on the side. I've already gone ahead and pre-fitted this just to test the locomotive and get it running. But when you take the top off, what you will see here is the blanking plate and the 18 pin decoders, it's simply a case of just pulling them up. You'll feel them click away and then lift out. And there's your 18 pin socket. You get your Trainomatic or other manufacturer DCC decoder and you need the connector end over the actual socket, in, push and you'll feel it kind of click into place there. You'll just feel it positively click in. The bulk of the chip needs to come this way. Once that's in it'll hold it nice and tight and then it's simply a case of working the chassis back in, making sure that none of the wires catch. It is a very tight fit, and as I said before, just make sure that none of the wires are catching. Don't force it, it will go in without a great deal of force application, but you'll know when it just snicks into place, and then it's simply a case of reattaching the couplings. When you do reattach these, they've got two little lugs on the bar there and they need to straddle this springy piece of plastic as that's part of the self-centering mechanism. And there you have it. Do up both of the screws, make sure that the couplings are perfectly self-centered and it is as easy as that. Straight onto the programming track and you're away. One of the other little features which this Terrier has, which I think is actually quite a nice touch, I was very skeptical when I first read the specs for it with the flickering firebox glow, but actually seeing it working in the flesh, it really does work quite nicely. You need an 18 pin decoder with at least two functions according to the manual, uh, but as far as I can tell that natively the flickering firebox is the only auxiliary function that you will be using on the locomotive unless you choose to customise your model and add your own lights. It's operated off the F3 button and that turns the firebox glow on and then another press of the button turns it off. The flickering pattern is actually partially random and it's actually quite nice to watch, especially if you turn the lights down. If you buy a factory fitted sound model, that firebox flicker will be synchronized to the chuffing of the model, but I don't believe that that is the case if you buy an aftermarket sound decoder. We turn now to the scores for this model. First up is finish. And really, this finish is exquisite. Even though the BR livery 
can be seen as being somewhat utilitarian. The lining on this model is exquisitely done and really does set the locomotive off nicely. The BR crest, the ferret and dart board, is really sharply done and really does look nice. And as I said during the review, I think the photographs that are online of this don't do it justice. It looks so much better in the flesh. The rest of the tampo printing is really nicely done. That fully finished and uh, uh, specced out cab interior is really, really nicely done. And the copper fittings on the boiler too are all really exquisite. We've also got the uh, nicely red and black finished motion inside the frames. You can just about make it out from the right angles and it really does add an extra special something to this model. So for finish, I'm gonna give it a 9.9 .9 out of 10. Functionality, this locomotive ran extremely well out of the box. It's really, really smooth and it does feel like there's a lot of low down torque in this motor. It's not too noisy and the transition in speed as you speed up and speed up is really, really nicely done. I didn't need to reprogram any of the CV values. I just put the DCC decoder in and away it went, which was really, really nice. The flickering firebox glow is actually quite a nice touch. Again, as I said before, seeing that in the specs on paper, I was skeptical, but seeing it in the flesh, it really does work. So I'm gonna give this model again a 9.9 .9 out of 10. Ease of use. Now, I actually found that DCC fitting this was pretty simple and straightforward, and the 18-pin decoder socket does give rise to a lot of easy access to features such as that auxiliary lighting function in the firebox and natively supporting sound fitting really, really easily. Because the speaker is already fitted in here from the factory, it's one less thing to bother about. And certainly from my experience of trying to fit sound into locomotives, fitting the speaker in is the hardest part. So Daypol and Rails have taken all of the aggro out of sound fitting this. So I'm gonna give it a 10 out of 10. Next up is aesthetics, and really this locomotive captures the look and feel of the A1X Terrier really, really nicely. Now, I wouldn't uh, pretend to be an expert on Terriers, but certainly what I see really does look the part. And the extra year or so that Rails and Daypol have taken to bring this to the market shows that they have refined and refined and really ironed out any even minor wrinkles. So there isn't anything that I can really fault on this. The detail is sublime but it's also rugged enough to stand up to handling, so nothing has parachuted off this with all the handling that I've done, and yet it still looks scale thickness and really, really nice. So for aesthetics, I'm gonna give this another 9.9 .9 out of 10. Last up, we come to value for money. Now, these locomotives are available in the non-DCC fitted form for £110, and the prices go up in tiers from there, either to have it factory fitted with DCC or to go for the full-on sound fitted. At the moment, only four liveries are available, and those four liveries are only available in DCC ready, not DCC fitted. Though I understand that the sound fitted versions are on their way shortly. So at £110, it cannot be denied that these are more expensive than the Hornby Retool Terrier, which comes in in the shops at around the £81 mark. So what do you get for that extra £29 and does that offer value for money? Well, this locomotive does give you a representation of the motion between the frames. It gives you slightly finer flush glazing and it gives you uh, an exquisite amount of just refined detail in terms of boiler fittings and those connecting rods. One of the other big areas for me is under the bonnet where it really does stand head and shoulders above. And that is factory fitted with a speaker and that flickering firebox glow. And also just 
generally a little bit easier on the DCC fitting. You're not fighting to get the chip in. You're not fighting for space at every step of the way. It just feels like that this model has been designed from the ground up to just work in everything that can be thrown at it. So yes, it is expensive, but if you want a sound fitted Terrier, this for me is the only choice. If you want that extra level of finesse, then £29 extra is not an awful lot to pay for that. So value for money, I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. I firmly believe that there is space on the market for both versions of these Terriers. And I don't want to sound like I'm taking a huge amount away from the Hornby one. But the Rails and Daypole Terrier just feels like it's a slightly more refined product. And when it comes to certain things like DCC sound fitting, they really do have the enthusiast's ease of use in mind at every step of the way. Final score, I'm giving this a 49.2 out of 50. Another really high score, yes, but quite honestly, the quality of models coming through are sublime, and this Terrier is no exception in that department. Can I recommend this model? Certainly, wholeheartedly, I can. I hope you found that really informative and really enjoyed that closer look at the new Rails of Sheffield Stroke Daypole Terrier. It's been so, so long awaited, but if you really like the look of what you saw, then we've got some affiliate links down in the description box below, and that'll help you out so you can go and find the Terrier that you want. Now, we've reviewed the BR Lakecrest version, but they've got so many other versions available either now or coming through in the next few weeks, including all of the different London, Brighton and South Coast liveries, Great Western Railway liveries, Southern Railway liveries, both Mainland and Isle of Wight, SECR liveries, and of course, BR Early Logo 2 and Kent and East Sussex Railway. So pretty much a broad cross section of everything that these locomotives did during their very long career. Also, don't forget to like this video, share it too, and also subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. And you can check us out over on Patreon and help us to make the videos that you want us to make. And it'd be really good to hear from you too down in the comments box down below. And we do read all of your comments, even if we're not able to answer every single one. But until next time, you take really good care of yourself and I hope to see you back again. Take care. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Judge Mortis, and Gary Lewis. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.